I'd like to speak with you about um, something that is near and dear to most of your hearts, and that is the predicament of people with Alzheimer's disease. Not that there's only one predicament. Uh, obviously, we know about predicaments such as the damage to the brain that is involved. And I'm actually very familiar with that kind of brain injury, not from personal experience myself, but because of, as a specialty in, in neuropsychology, which was sort of neuroscience in those days as well, I spent a lot of time learning about how the brain works. Now, the kind of predicament I really want to speak with you about tonight is the predicament that people face because of social and psychological aspects of their lives. And one way to get at this is to think about our own lives and the kinds of relationships we have with other people. And, and each of us, without having multiple personality disorders, each of us, that's supposed to be funny folks, you don't have that. Sort of <laughs> each of us has many different kinds of social personae, if you will. And, and so there is the way we behave with people at our jobs. There's the way we behave with our children, the way we behave with our parents, the way we behave with dear friends, the way we behave with acquaintances, the people in the stores that we, at which we shop. There are all these different ways of, of acting. And, and you, you really have to understand that most of these relationships, be they devoted parent or loving spouse or dear friend, most of those kinds of relationships are what we could call jointly constructed. That is, you can't be my dear friend if I don't cooperate with you. If I say, well, who the hell are you? Get out of here. You can't act. You can't play out those roles. And, and the, really, the reason this is so darn important, that I'm getting what I'm going to get to tonight, the reason this is so darn important is because you, as policy-oriented people, are talking to people on Capitol Hill about money and funding and where it's going to go and how badly we need it to help people diagnosed and their families. And people on Capitol Hill, when they hear you speak, are very often wanting to know about pharmacological stuff. And, 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 that is, and there's a good reason for that. I mean, you think about it historically, when we think about disease, who do you talk to when there's an illness? You talk to the doctor, the physician. And so there's been essentially a, a hegemony uh, in terms of, of the, the specialties and the experts in terms of who, to whom we talk to and to whom we, we try to get funding for. It, we're always looking to get, get the medicine, get the drug, get the cure. But in the meantime, people with Alzheimer's disease are living in social worlds. And the way we interact with them can either help or hinder them. I mean, it's, it's enough that they have brain damage, and it's enough that we can't do anything to stop it. But we all, we all can do something to stop behaving in ways, innocently behaving in ways that are less helpful to them. And so what I'd like to talk with you tonight about is some of the dynamics that lead us to unknowingly, unwittingly, behave in ways that aren't helpful. And when we behave in ways that aren't helpful to people diagnosed, we're behaving in ways that aren't helpful to us. So we're all in this whole thing together. And so think about this joint construction of relationships. So each of us has a variety of personae. And the thing that happens, and, and, and so the thing that happens is, when a person is diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease, that becomes one of their personae. You have become an Alzheimer's patient. And, and the power of that descriptor, I'll get to in a little while. But I also want to call your attention, is, what I'm about to say is connected to that. I want to call your attention also to the aspects of ourselves that we can call attributes. So all of us have mental and physical attributes. You're so you're this high, you're this tall, you're this weight, you have this color eyes, those are physical attributes. We have mental attributes. You like to do crossword puzzles. You like to do Sudoku. You're bad with languages. You can, you can play music by ear. There are lots of mental and physical attributes we have. And among the attributes we have are, are, are also our beliefs, spiritual, mental, uh, uh, ethical, political, we have beliefs, and we have beliefs about our attributes as well. 
So there are things about us, each of us, that we like and we're proud of, and there are things about ourselves we don't like and are ashamed of. Now, embarrassed about. Now think about it this way. What I'd like you to do is, I'm going to do a little thought experiment. Each of you, including me, each of us, is like Mary Poppins. We're practically perfect in every way. Practically perfect doesn't mean perfect. It means practically. It means that we have, each of us has an imperfection. What I would like you to do is I'd like you to think about one of your attributes that you don't like and that you have tried to change and have failed to change. Right? And maybe it's an attribute that you don't think is so bad, but your significant other does. And so it's really bad. But, so you have one? You have one of those? Everybody have one of those? Anybody not? <clears throat> All right. Now, what I'd like you to consider is how you would feel if everyone you encountered Everyone you encountered saw you principally for that attribute. Everyone you met upon being introduced, everyone sees you for that attribute. The one about which you are ashamed and embarrassed, the one you've tried to change and can't. Now, think about how that feels. And if you think about how that feels, you can then begin to empathize with the predicament of a person diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. Because that person is being seen principally for that attribute. And what happens when that happens is a whole bunch of things. So here is a person who feels embarrassed by, by this illness, about the effects of it, and, and sometimes hides socially because of it. Uh, I, I worked for, for two years with a lady who had been, a, I mean, she had a PhD in sociology. And when she was 67, she got her master's degree in social work. And that's when the memory problems began. And I remember asking her, you were in classes with graduate students with, who, who were half your age? Well, how did that feel? And she said, well, I, and now she's 75 years old, you understand, at the time I'm speaking with her, and she's been diagnosed for the past couple of years. And, but she had memory disorders long before that. Um, and she said, well, I've never discriminated against anybody because of their age. <laughs> she was incredibly sharp, but she wouldn't speak. And she said, I don't talk. I, and she went to her support group, and she hardly ever spoke. And I, I said, well, why don't you? And she said, I can't talk. And the reason she said that was because her whole life had been about words. And she always spoke beautifully. I read letters that she had written decades earlier. And she was powerful, powerful intellect. She was a classmate of Saul Bellow in, at the University of Chicago. <clears throat> she was extraordinary. And she believed she couldn't speak because she couldn't use those words that, that spoke with elan that were so beautiful. She, would, she said to me one day, um, I, she's telling me a story about when she was growing up, and she said, my parents got some, some kids, she had moved out of their house, my parents got some kids in view of me, and she said, that's not the word, and she was really upset. And I said, I, I, I know that's not the word. She didn't want in view of, and I said, I know what the word is, and it's a French word. She wanted, she was going for in lieu of, she said in view of. And she said, yeah, I said, I understood what you meant. You know, she said, yeah, but you know too much. Uh, and, and, and lots of other people wouldn't know. And she was right. And so what happens very often is the way people react to the losses they have and to being seen for that is to hide. And, 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 and these reactions can be really appropriate. So people will do things that are totally appropriate given their condition. So this lady doesn't want to talk because she's not speaking the way she knows she used to be able to speak. Now that's not a symptom of disease, it's a reaction to something, it's a logical reaction. Why would you try to do something that was going to make you look bad? And the fact that she did that meant that she was thinking on a very high level. I mean, none of us will put ourselves into a position where we're going to be embarrassed. If you did, it would be pathological. 
So if a person has Alzheimer's and is acting in a way to preserve his or her pride and dignity, that's positive. Now maybe it's going to be looked at as uncooperative in certain ways, and we'll get to that. So the person with Alzheimer's needs to be understood in light of all of this. And one of the only ways you can do that is by putting yourself in that person's position and think about it. Because this person is not some abstract individual, but somebody who's actually living and reflecting on his or her own state of mind and being. So, when a person with Alzheimer's is seen increasingly as a patient, that means not as a person. And their actions can be interpreted with that narrative in mind. So, for example, and usually, you know, very often, I, and when I've spoken to groups like this, I'll usually try and find a man who's wearing uh, some kind of sweater, or as they say in England, a jumper, and bring him up on the stage or something. But I'm, I mean, you, you've got one of those, but I'm not going to do this to you. <clears throat> anyway, I, I, to give you the example, I was standing in the hallway at this adult day center, and um, one of the participants, a woman who had been diagnosed with Alzheimer's four years earlier, is about to be picked up by his wife. And so, I'm sorry, picked up by her husband. So she, he comes in, and we're chatting in the hall with some staff members, and one of the staff members asks Mrs. D, did you have a nice day today? And, this, and, and she says, and before she can say anything, her husband jumps in and says, oh, she loves coming to the day center. She's always hurrying me in the morning. To Who asked you? I mean, she, he just interrupted her. Anyway, so then another question is put to her. And now she was standing there. It was the winter, and she had a, a top that was a sweater that was over, her blou it was over her blouse and outside of her trousers or slacks. And as she's answering the question, her husband starts tucking in her top, her sweater, into her slacks. And she's standing there like this. He doesn't see it. They go home. Two days later, I'm there again. He, he comes over to me, Doc, I gotta talk to you. What's the matter? The Alzheimer's is getting worse. What do you mean? Well, the other day when I took her home, you were there when I took her, picked her home, yeah. I took her home, and that night she wouldn't look at me, she wouldn't talk to me, nothing. She was getting irrationally hostile. Because as we know, irrational hostility is a symptom of Alzheimer's disease. And I said, well, I'm pretty sure she was hostile toward you, but I don't think it was irrational. <laughs> I mean, I explained, well, do, do you remember when you were 10 years old or something like that, and you were out in the street with your friends, and your mother came over and started neatening up your clothes? And get out of here, right? I mean, she's 70 years old. She looked fine. Well, I did it because I thought she forgot to tuck it in. When I... He was innocently doing this stuff. She got angry because she, was, she had every right to. So, so her righteous indignation was interpreted as irrational hostility because he was thinking of everything as a symptom of disease rather than a symptom of mental health. And we have to keep that kind of stuff in mind because it's the same thing holds true of, for uh, aimless wandering. Who takes a walk and who wanders? So I'm standing in a manor care a place in the area and um, Arden Courts, what have you, and, and, and there's a, a hub kind of area in the middle and the hallways go off as spokes in a wheel. And so the marketing director is showing us around, and, and, he, and there's a woman, a, a resident, walking around and around and around and around. He says, oh, that's one of our wanderers. She's just walk, wandering around. She does it aimlessly forever. And I'm thinking, well, why is that aimless wandering? What, what does she have to do here? I mean, she could be sitting in a chair in front of a television set that she didn't turn on, at a, watching a program she doesn't want to see. She can't turn it off. She, what, what, what are her choices? And maybe she's kind of antsy because she doesn't recall the last time she saw her loved ones. I, th there could be a, maybe she just doesn't want to sit. And where is there to go? So, have you ever, you ever feel that way? Have you ever been sitting for a while and just want to get up and walk? I, it happens to me all the time. I'm riding. And I have to get up. If my neck's got, I've got to move. But when I do it, it's perfectly reasonable. But I'm not diagnosed. But the minute a person is diagnosed, a lot of normal things can be, can be viewed as abnormal. And that's a real problem. And that's consistent with the storyline of being a patient 
or being worse, called demented. I, I know a lot of professionals who actually call, use demented as synonymous with diagnosed with dementia. And that is an awful thing because as you know, demented means to be without a mind. Anybody here a Harry Potter fan? You read Harry Potter? The guards at the prison of Azkaban were called the Dementors, which left you nothing. Now, why would, you know, to me, if a person is sane, he or she would not try to have a conversation with someone whom he thought had no mind. Why would you do that? You can't call someone demented because the person isn't. 